Buenos días. Toda la energía que ayer se respiraba se sigue respirando hoy. Esperemos que también se transmita vía streaming a todas las personas que nos seguís de manera online y que estéis disfrutando de lo que está aconteciendo aquí. Estamos en la segunda jornada del Congreso Internacional de Enfoque Dialógico y lo que hoy nos aguarda es la oportunidad de seguir aprendiendo, disfrutando. Vamos a conocer perspectivas internacionales, también estrategias que nos van a servir para el día a día de nuestra actividad. Es lo que nos aguarda en esta mañana. También os me quería presentar... Eh, Formalmente, bien, ayer no lo hice, yo soy Cristina Ochoa, soy periodista, no trabajo en lo social, pero sí que conozco vuestro mundo lo suficiente para admirar la labor que hacéis, que no es nada fácil y que además agradece. Y el hecho de que estéis aquí es síntoma de que os preocupa y ocupa porque queréis mejorar el modelo de atención a las personas y eso es un gran reto del cual toda la ciudadanía nos vamos a beneficiar. Así que, qué bien que estemos aquí tantas, tantas personas. Vamos a comenzar. Lo vamos a hacer, además, más, eso sí, recordando, por si acaso hay alguien que se incorpora por primera vez, que sepa que tiene sistemas de traducción simultánea a la salida, que también que todas las ponencias se colgarán en la web en unos días para poder verlas con más detenimiento y que ahora vamos a tener la oportunidad de disfrutar de la conferencia de Heiki Ervast, que es alguien que muchos de vosotros conocéis porque ha sido el formador de quienes habéis asistido a este proceso de aprendizaje. Él es CEO en Dialogues Design Limited en Finlandia, es formador de métodos de trabajo dialógico y además experto en liderazgo y diseño de servicios educativos. Es doctor en filosofía, máster en educación y además, entre otros cargos, en la ciudad de Rovaniemi ha sido jefe de educación, guardería y cultura, también de servicios escolares y en la Universidad de Laponia, director de la Escuela de Magisterio. Además, hace gala de un excelente sentido del humor, cosa que agradecemos en estas tierras tremendamente, que ayer disfrutamos y seguro que hoy también ¿Qué nos va a hablar? Nos va a contar cómo poder realizar una buena formación en enfoque dialógico y también cómo evaluar de manera eficaz esos procesos de implementación de enfoque dialógico. Así que, como siempre, con muchas ganas de escucharle. Le damos un aplauso a Heike. Bienvenido. Can I stand here? The lights, oh, yes. I used to be a lightning designer too, so I know where to, how to stand in the lights. Uh, because Christina used all the languages I was going to use to say good morning, I will say only bonas. Uh, the title here it says that. Uh, How can a dialogical training be a driving force to create a change in services? What's, how do we do it? What is the meaning? And uh, I was looking at the title and uh, stopped for the word modelo. I started thinking that very often people ask, uh, talk about dialogical method. And especially at the beginning of the training, they ask us, tell us what it is so that we know the method. So I started, uh, I decided to start uh, with the words model and method. If you follow a model or use a method, what do you do? Have a short two minutes, three minutes dialogue with your person sitting beside you. What do you do when you follow a model or use a method? Concretely, what do you do? Please.
Ok, muchas gracias, Eskeri Casco, gracias mille, thank you, what is it in Portuguese? <laughs> Obrigado. <laughs> what else languages did you use? I have said that. <laughs> okay. Uh, for me, it came uh, a picture that if I use a method, I take something that is outside me to use, like a tool or when I'm uh, constructing something. If I follow a model, it's sort of like a construction drawing, or if I'm orienteering, I'm looking at the map, so I have to turn here. So now I follow a model, dialogical approach is not a model and a method, because it's not outside, it's inside. That's the difference, uh, semantics about this model, model word. But I will come back to this. Anyhow, uh, is there a need for doing things differently? So why do we need a change? Why do we need to learn new working methods? Because we want to entertain us or find interesting things to do, or is there a need? Uh, the need comes from several perspectives. And the first one uh, that is in my mind that when we are helping people as professionals in, in our silos. Uh, we know a lot about that kind of cases. We are trained for that. We have education for that. So we are professionals. So it's very easy to see what's the problem with the person and what the person should do. And uh, then if I'm saying someone that, okay, this is the question, this is the pain in the ass, you should do this way, it gets better. Whose case is it then? It's professional's case, it's not the client's case. So the first thing is to remember that uh, these cases are not ours, they are client cases. And then there is a need to work differently because life, as Tom yesterday told in his presentation, life is cross-sectoral. We can't uh, help people only by staying in our own silo or ways of working. We need cooperation and we must cross borders. But how to organize this kind of multi-professional networking this is one thing that we deal quite a lot of in this dialogical training. So how to cooperate, although we are in those silos? Do we explode these silos away so that it's easier to cooperate? I think at some time in Finland there was a period when they created in municipality services uh, new departments which were combinations of something. And of course, uh, the names of the professions are changing all the time because of these needs. But uh, uh, th this is what I have learned from you, Tom. It's not necessary to uh, explode the silos and, and uh, structures. We just have to have capabilities to cross the borders. So cooperate. And then there is the question, when do we act, with whom and how? This belongs also to the networking and need for do something differently. Are we acting early enough or too late? This has been going on a long time, why nobody has done anything for it? And then maybe... For me, the most important thing why, why we need a change is to realize that the uh, future is coming anyhow. If we are staying here looking at these things that uh, we have 
troubles with and we're dealing it and we don't anticipate where we are going. If the future is there and we are looking things here, we are every day we are moving towards the future. So would it be a good idea that uh, at some point stop looking at the past and the present time problems and look at the, what's coming there? This is the anticipation dialogues. You could call them what if dialogues. If I do this way, what does it mean? What happens if I do that way? These are the Sorry, putting too late this Spanish slide, but I think that Saul and David have already translated my slide, so this is only repetition. And uh, then, what uh, makes a dialogical approach a driving force when we start acting dialogically? What, where does the power come? It comes from the fact that we are coming back into our basic nature. We are dialogical persons, not so much individual persons as we think. And in, service, uh, in our services we, we are dealing very often with individuals. I'm coming from the school sector and we are creating a lot of uh, helping methods for the individuals. We are giving diagnoses for bad behavior, children, etc., etc. But we don't talk so much about what is the position of this child in this classroom, in this society. What are the connections and relations to other people? So, to remember that we were born dialogical, our first dialogues start immediately when we were born, even before. It's producing voices, movements, and parents are repeating and... This is the first dialogue that starts on. Yeah. And uh, it's all, all the time going on now. We are doing it. We are doing the same thing. <laughs> this is what we are doing here. So, uh, being a dialogical person means that it's the way how we develop, grow and become what we are. And uh, if we get response from someone, it means that that someone is confessing my existence. I am something because they listen to me and they respond to me. That's uh, nowadays one form of bullying in schools. They are, because bullying is a difficult case in schools and especially in nowadays in social media, but uh, kids don't uh, use so much words and violence, visible violence in schools anymore. They just uh, turn their back to someone. I'm bullying Jukka by being this way. You don't exist to me. <laughs> the same thing. So, what kind of capabilities are needed? Uh, to make this change through dialogical processes. These are very simple elements because we are in the basis of life. We must learn to listen. When we are creating things together, when we are cooperating, it's, it's a question of thinking together. What do you think if we would do this way? What is your response? We are thinking together and in group. We need also facilitation because uh, this speaking and listening, to separate them, it doesn't happen by just telling people, please listen to each other, 
don't interrupt. You have to practice and uh, to make it possible to practice it, we need people who can help with this. And they are called facilitators. And we are training, we have trained here facilitators. It takes one and a half year to become a facilitator, or a little bit less, but uh, the trainers, trainer, trainers are uh, doing it one and a, in a one and a half year. And then you have to have a capability to accept that the other person is the other person. The other person is not in the position I am. We must respect the otherness. Well, we are very willing to take a control of the other person. Because uh, we are looking, is the other person same as me or different? If, if Jukka is different, is Jukka dangerous to me? And so on. We do it naturally. We have to learn to respect the otherness. We can't get hold on the other per person in that sense. And again, anticipating the future. And this is uh, the one thing we have been doing. And Tom was also yesterday talking about, uh, instead of problems, talking about worries. This worry thinking is a background for facing to the future, to anticipate the future. So, to make this change, we do dialogical trainings, we train facilitators, all people to become aware of dialogical approach. For example, in a shorter course, is how to use some dialogical tools in meetings and make our ordinary working meetings a little bit more dialogical. So the training is listening and speaking practices. We start with this. And we, we start saying that, okay, please speak three minutes like yesterday you did. And then you don't comment, just listen. And then it's your turn and your turn and your turn. To separate speaking and listening. Because when we comment, we express ourselves, our thoughts and emotions. And if we do it immediately, we get the relief. I got a possibility to say, but my ears are closing. So one rule is uh, bite your tongue and listen. Or do this. Then we practice uh, interviewing, how to make questions to help other people to think, listen, uh, anticipate the future, that kind of things. I'm not presenting now the tools we are using because it says that I have three minutes left. I have a timer here. It's good that also I have a timer, because we are using always timers in our trainings. Okay. Then we practice these facilitation skills. And uh, like yesterday, we heard a good example here about how important is uh, how we invite people into dialogical meetings. The invitation letter or an email or whatever. The contents are very important because uh, it should be helping the people to take part. Then we take up, practice how to take up worries, how to handle challenging situations. And one of the most important things, which comes automatically when we are using, doing these practices, to be present in the moment. So, listen, we have eye contact. This is also part of the training. We are saying people, don't look at us, look at each other. And that, that's why we organize chairs in a way, that people look at each other. How to face another person. 
if that other person says something that is a little bit unpleasant for me, what is my reaction? If I get uh, problematic emotions, how can I continue facilitate the situation? These will happen for everyone. And then we have a quite a wide range of dialogical tools that we are practicing. So, on the basis of this, coming back to the original question about model and method, dialogical approach is not a method that you take from the self and, uh, okay, this sounds interesting, I shall use this. It's difficult, there are problems, it's not a good, I put it away. This is not a method that you can take like a hammer or saw when you construct something. The method in dialogical approach is you. Pedro is a method. That's why these methods have, uh, we have, uh, during this year, had 95 different dialogical methods, variations. And this is the reason why, uh, when you start doing dialogical things, you are the method yourself. And this is the reason why it can't stop anymore. If you take the first step, poliki, poliki, you can't go back anymore. <laughs> you are different. So, congratulations. This is the driving force. We people. Not something that we take in use. Okay, this is a good apparat I'm going to use in this case. It's a difficult case. I have a social sector case which is very difficult. I have passed four seconds. Okay. I will use this one. No, it's you. You are working on it. So that's the reason why it's so powerful driving force. And then Then we start practicing it. These people are looking at each other. It seems that David has a turn, David has a turn to speak. Monica is very enthusiastic about what David was saying. So they are uh, facing each other. And uh, you can see that they are all looking at the person who is speaking. They have a contact. And then we make public notes. And public notes uh, are written on a flip chart paper, but also on a computer. And if you have a projector, you can uh, put the notes on the screen. The other facilitator is writing the notes. And uh, in the end, uh, they are sent to the participants. They are not published in the newspaper only for the participants. Because when you are saying something and Beatrice is writing down, okay, she understood me this way. It's a feedback for me. When I'm speaking in a dialogue, I have my inner thoughts that I'm expressing. I hear myself speaking my own voice in the room. That is one feedback. Then I can sense how people are looking and what is their body language. And then the facilitator is writing notes. Okay, I was understood in that way. Every now and then the facilitator <coughs> asked, asks, uh, did I hear right? Is this a right note about what you said? And... Uh, we, we have been doing training in Camar de Comercio. We are going there to have lunch over there. The, all the walls were full of papers, public notes. Thinking, thinking. The circles are sometimes quite large. 
or big circles, many people, but variation is, uh, there. it can be a pair dialogue, so dialogues of three people, or four, five, six. And sometimes in the end we have all the participants in a one round. Sometimes it thinking in expressing is very intensive. <laughs> I ask a promise for this. <laughs> And uh, because we have been also talked about dialogical spaces, which Tom has created on the basis of bar thinking from Japan, uh, dialogical spaces don't mean only sitting on a chairs or behind tables. We can go outside, have dialogues over there, or we can have a peripathetic walk in the park, and and af after coming back there. We, we may be answering a questionnaire with our mobile phones and so on. Different kind of variations. So, okay, there was still a, a year ago it was quite warm when we were having dialogues. And Gracias. Eskeri Kasto. Paljon kello on. A question or? Alguna pregunta? Tenéis para Heike? Alguien tiene algo que preguntarle? Seguro que mucho, pero aquí en, moment, en este momento. No questions because I used the time for questions <laughs> with, with the lapis style. <laughs> Mira, una pregunta, Heike. Mm. Eh, ¿Qué consejo le daríais para? Sorry. Yeah, I can translate. No. Yeah. ¿Qué no. consejo le darías a ellos, a ellas, para que contagien a otros profesionales? Porque claro, ellos están convencidos, pero luego se relacionan con otras personas que no están convencidas. Which advice will you give them to eh, contagiar? Perdón. <laughs> Spread <laughs> to make other professionals to go for this uh, dialogue, di dialogic approach? The only way uh, to get familiar with dialogical approach is to take part in dialogues. So How can they convince them? I mean, it's even not a question of convincing. This is not a convincing method. You have to take part in dialogues and you get your own experiences. For example, at the beginning of the training, very often people want to uh, tell us also the theory part. What is it? Because uh, it's a question of safety. We want to know so that it's not causing too much harm mm -hmm. for our way of being and living. Tell what it is. And we say, okay, we tell you a little bit. But later we will tell more. First come the experiences. After experiences, you know. We tried this uh, uh, on the fifth month of the training and said, now it's time for the theory. And we created a big package of theory. The response was, we don't want theory. <laughs> so invite people to your dialogues. That's the way how it goes. And of course, then you have to contact Kobirande Navar and ask uh, dialogical trainings and that kind of things. And then, because we have now 11 networks of facilitators in Navarra region, if you have a need in your case, I would need help for this. Almost everywhere there is a network you can contact. Thank you very much. Un aplauso para él, por favor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.